I've been crucified with Christ I've been crucified with Christ I no longer live but Christ lives in me Our Bible study lesson today the apostolic doctrine of eschatology and for the next few lessons we're going to be talking about contextual inconsistencies there are a lot of them we'll be bringing out a lot of these in the next few lessons the thought that if you don't believe what the church believes you can't be a part of it keeps a lot of people from even considering or seeing the teaching of the Bible we all read the same Bible and it says only what it says but too often we try to see it in what we want to see and faulty assumptions and it, that encourage undisciplined freedom in interpretation often occur unlearning is always a somewhat painful process of discarding pet ideas and long believed long held theories that will not hold up under honest scrutiny of the scriptures it is our duty to search the scriptures to see if the things that are being taught are true in acts chapter 17 and verse 11 these were more noble than those in thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Belief in the absolute truth of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only answer to division amongst us in the church today. We must let Him, who He is, and what He has done truly be the basis of our, our unity. To do this, we must look to Bible history and the first century Christians. Audience relevance is a key factor in understanding the truths of God's Word. We are enlightened by the scriptures of truth to understand about God's redemption. When believers understand the will and purpose of God in their lives, our faith and trust in God and His Word give us hope to endure and persevere in the trials and temptations of life. It gives us strength. It gives us an empowerment to run in the Christian race. We have got to unlearn and rid ourselves of biblically false ideas that cannot stand against the scrutiny of the scriptures. Remember, the faith that cannot be tested by scripture is the faith that cannot be trusted. The more you know about the past, the better prepared you are for the future. The answers to our questions are not in the future. They lie in the past. Book, chapter, verse, person, place, and thing. They are in the past. There are many things being taught in churches today that are taken out of context and not fully examined in the scriptures. Context is the scriptural environment that surrounds a word or a passage of scripture that throws light on its meaning. This is called contextual consistency. It is only after all of the scriptures have been examined on any particular subject that true Bible doctrine can be established. The word doctrine means teaching or the specifics or the specifications of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many preachers, in order to make their sermons say what they want their congregations to believe, simply do not tell the whole story. Their sermons are based on bits and pieces of scriptures here, there, and everywhere. There was once a, a, a famous radio announcer, his name was Paul Harvey, and he would tell a story and in the story, he would say everything that was known about an individual, a happenstance, uh, a situation, an event. After he told the story, then he would always say to his audience, Now, ladies and gentlemen, the rest of the story. And then that's when he would bring out all of the facts. 
and it completely changed the story that he had just told. So it is with the Word of God. So it is with the truth. We have to go beyond what's being said. Everything that's being said today in churches simply, many things simply contradict the Word of God. Here's an example. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now there are simply millions of people who are being deceived by this scripture. They believe that all they have to do to be saved is to accept Christ as their personal Savior and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. But when you look at all of the scriptures, you find something totally different. First of all, the book of Romans was written to people who were already born again Christians. Romans 1 and 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus said in John chapter 3, verses 3, 5, and 7. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. Now these first century Christians in Rome, in the Apostolic Church of Rome, they were already Holy Ghost filled and baptized in the name of Jesus. They were born again. They were in the kingdom of God. When you read Romans chapter 10, verse 14, 15, and 17, you see the problem. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And shall, how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15. And how should they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now here's where we see the problem. Many people are preaching, as it is today, that God has not called or sent. John chapter 3 and verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Many of the preachers that are preaching today, they say things that contradict the word of God in the Bible. God has said in the scriptures, and because people do not read and study their Bible, they, they don't really know or understand what God has said. But God Himself said, Every man is a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. So when it comes to scriptures, because a lot of people don't know their Bible, they don't read their Bible, they don't study their Bible, they simply believe the man that's at the pulpit, believe what he is saying to them about their salvation. And it is a deadly mistake. It is an unforgivable mistake. Many church people simply believe what their preacher says without checking things out. We read that scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. In Proverbs 14, verse 12 and 15, this is what the Bible says. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. It also says in, in the book of Proverbs, Lean not unto thine own understanding. The Bible cannot mean what the Bible never meant. It simply says what it means, and it means what it says. We need to read out of it what it says, and not read into it what we want it to say. There's only one doctrine to follow in Scripture, and that is the Apostles' Doctrine. 
in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. If you can't believe the men that followed Jesus, you can't believe anybody. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So salvation is connected to the doctrine. The doctrine are the specifics. When all else fails, it has always been said, read the directions. The directions are there in the book we call the Bible. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus... When I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. This is the Apostle Paul telling Timothy, Make sure that no other doctrine is taught except the Apostles' doctrine. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Many churches today tell people that study the Bible if what they study contradicts their church dogma to stay away from them, to mark them, to avoid them. But that's a scripture that the Apostle Paul told those first century saints to be mindful of. To be mindful of the people that were saying things that contradicted the Apostles' doctrine. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. The way you neglect your salvation is simply not read your Bible, not study your Bible, not search things out and allow yourself to be misled and deceived by a man that calls himself preacher, pastor, deacon, bishop whatever the title may be. Jesus said in the, in the book of John chapter 10, My sheep know my voice, and another they will not follow. The problem is, many sheep that go to church today don't even know what the Bible says. They follow their pastor, their ministry. They follow what is said at the pulpit with, without ever examining things. The voice of God is the Word of God. Psalms 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is the word of the Lord. In John chapter 17, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, verse 20, prayed this prayer. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me, through their word. It's the apostolic doctrine that we follow. A lot of big name preachers that are on TV and on the radio today, a lot of big name positions that are in big large churches, they weren't there when Jesus was walking on the earth, but the apostles were. Jesus himself is telling us, he's praying for us, if we follow the teachings and the doctrine of the apostles. The commonality of the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. What it says to one person, it says to all people all over the world. What it requires of one person, it requires of all persons, all people, all over the world. It has for almost 2,000 years, and it always will. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It will never change. The apostles were given the words of eternal life. In John chapter 6, verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And in John chapter 17, in verse 8, notice what Jesus said. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. 
If you're interested in eternal life, you must follow the apostles' doctrine, the teaching of the scriptures. Because what Jesus gave to them, they give to us. And we give to those that follow after us. It never changes. It's exactly the same message that was first given. That message was given on the day of Pentecost almost 2,000 years ago. And that message simply said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, for the removal, for the pardoning, for the cleansing, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you feel that God has called you and you've never received this experience that came for the first time 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost, you are selling yourself short. A lot of times people never know what's available because of the church they attend. The church they attend, they don't believe in this experience. The church they attend, they're preachers. They don't have it, so they're never going to tell you about something they don't have. You have got to keep searching. You've got to keep looking. You will find God because God is the one that is drawing you. A lot of times people, when they respond to the drawing of God, they go to whatever church that they are associated with, whether it's this church or that church, this denomination or that denomination. They are looking for God. The old saying is true. God is from Missouri. Missouri is known as the show me state. And every time you take a step toward God, whether it's to go to this church or that Bible study, you're showing God that you're interested. You're proving to God you're interested. You want to know who He is. You want to be what He wants you to be. The apostles had the words of eternal life. They and only they had the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? You must do something. Faith without works is dead. You have to do something. Faith is an action word. Faith is something that you prove by acts of obedience. In John chapter 3, verse 3, 5, and 7, we read that Jesus said, You must be born again. You have to be born of the water and you have to be born of the Spirit. It's not a natural birth. It's a spiritual birth. And you see that spiritual birth enacted throughout the Scriptures. Everywhere the apostles went, everywhere they preached, everyone was always baptized in lakes, rivers, and streams by submersion, having the name of Jesus Christ said over them. Why? Because the blood of Jesus is in the name of Jesus. The life of Jesus is in the name of Jesus. So it's important that we understand what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. That's not the way to get saved. That's the way for born-again Christians to stay saved. Because in living this life from the cradle to the grave, no matter if you are saved, in your body is a nature that is contrary to God. The old saying is this, in my chest are two natures. I'm talking about born-again Christians. In my chest are two natures. The one I love, the other I hate. The one that I allow to get away with things is the one that always dominates. The law of sin is in your flesh. Jesus, He defeated the reign of sin in our lives, but He did not defeat the existence of sin. Inside your body is a nature. It's in your members. In Romans chapter 7, verse 23, the scripture said, So with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. You do what your flesh tells you to do. You become subject to what your flesh tells you to do. In weakness you do weak things. In strength you do strong things. It's important that we understand what the scriptures are saying. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, I quoted the scripture that the apostle Peter used on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. That was the obedience to the command of Matthew 28, 19, and 20. You have to understand 
Matthew 28, 19, and 20 was not a baptismal service. No one is standing there waiting to be baptized. Jesus is commissioning the apostles to go. They did go. They went to the day of Pentecost. And it was there that God gave them the promise of the Holy Ghost. He gave them the power. He gave them that anointing. And from that day forward, that's the message that they preached. They preached it in Acts chapter 8, verse 16. They preached it in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 to 30, 43 to 48. They preached it in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. They preached it in, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. All through the New Testament, everyone that was ever born again, everyone that ever became a Christian, they were all baptized. Read your Bible. Open the, the Bible and look for yourself. It's in there. Believe it. Trust God. He will lead you and guide you. In John chapter 38, verse 39, chapter 7, I'm sorry, verse 38, 39, notice what it said. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures, you will receive this experience. I've told people I don't know how many times, go stick your finger in a wall socket and see if you have an experience. The power and the presence of God is an experience. It's very emotional. It will alter you. It will change your life. You're just a lamp when you come into this world. But when you get plugged into a power source like the Holy Ghost of God, you will become a light and the life of God will emanate out of your life. In the bulb that you turn on in your home, that filament inside the bulb, when it makes a connection with the power of electricity, it emanates. It shines. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You're not a light until you get plugged into a source of power, and that is the Spirit of God. A lot of people say they have it. They received it by faith. They never spoke in other tongues. What they may have is a blessing of the Spirit. But to have the baptism, you've got to receive the Spirit of God inside of your temple. Your body becomes a temple of the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 9, verse 6, the Apostle Paul was on his way to Damascus to persecute that first century Christian church. He had an experience on the road. Listen. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He met Jesus Christ that day. He was put down on the ground. He was blinded for three days. His immediate re request was, What must I do? What do you want me to do, Lord? And the Lord said, And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. It was something that the Apostle Paul had to do. Now a lot of people want to refer to Romans 10.13 as Romans Road. But people were being saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ long before Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle and wrote all the epistles in the New Testament. So the original message is still there. It never changed. It was still there. It's still here today. It is still the thing that God requires. He's going to come back. The scripture said in Thessalonians that he was going to come back in flaming vengeance and fire on those that obeyed not the gospel. Obedience is key to your salvation. God would rather have you obey than to give money and give sacrifice. A lot of people get active in church. A lot of churches are nothing more than activity centers. They're trying to make up, fill the void of the lack of spirituality or spiritual life in their lives by simply being busy around church. But it's not that's not the way it should be. In Acts chapter 16, verse 30 to 33, that question is asked by the Philippian jailer. But notice what the scripture says. And brought them out and said, Sirs, 
what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his home. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. There's more to living for God than simply believing. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, the Bible said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So believing is simply a place to begin. To be saved, you've got to do something. You've got to obey the Word of God. In Acts chapter 19, the Scripture gives us an example of the Apostle Paul in Corinth coming upon some disciples. He didn't call them sinners. He called them disciples. As long as you do everything you know to do in your conquest to find God, God will make sure that you hear the rest of the message. These were good-hearted Baptist people. Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 6. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now these were believers. They were called believers, but yet they were not saved. They were not born again. But when they heard the rest of the message, I myself, when I came to the Lord, I came to the Lord through a denominational church, but I was rebaptized when I began to read and study my Bible and saw that there's only one correct way to be baptized in the Bible, and that is by submersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the doctrine of the apostles. I was rebaptized. There have been many people in our church that have come from different places, different denominations, who were looking for a relationship. They didn't want just a religion. They were looking for a relationship. When they found that they had not had been given all the message, they saw it and they too were rebaptized and God filled them with that same Pentecostal Holy Ghost experience. It's for you today. It's for whosoever will. You can get it. I know people in Africa, people in China, they're getting the Holy Ghost experience all over the world. Whatever it takes for you to do that. Remember, you're going to die one day. The scripture says in Hebrews 9.27, It is appointed unto all men wants to die. What really matters is what, what's going to happen to you after death. I ask people all the time, have you ever been to a funeral? Yeah. But what do you think happened to the guy that was laying there in the coffin? He's gone. You're never going to see him again. He's not coming back. But it's your day. It's your time. It's your opportunity. That's why the scripture said it is good to go to the house of mourning because it's there we are all made to see our end. That's the destiny of men, is you're going to die. It's going to be a natural death. Remember, if you're born once, you're going to die twice. If you're born twice, you will only die once, and that is the physical death. Many people, they are so confused today because the churches they attend, and the preachers that they follow, they're just wrong. God is not the author of confusion. The only way you can get confusion out of the Scriptures 
is when you try to change the original meaning of what those scriptures are saying. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So when you get confused, remember, it's not God that's confusing you. Somebody is seeking to change the original meaning of God's word. That's the only way you can get confusion. The scripture said there's no private interpretation to the scripture. There's only one way to look at it, and that's the right way, and that's the way God looks at it. Your church cannot save you, and being good is simply not good enough. Being busy at the church, going to the church all the time, will not do the job. You must do something. You got to do something to be saved, folks. Believing is just the beginning. It was through disobedience that sin came into our world, and with sin came death by sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and verse 19. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It is only through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ that eternal life can come to you. Eternal life is here today. Natural, physical death, it's going to come to everybody. Hebrews 9.27 Only the truth can save you. And that is through book, chapter, and verse, and by scriptural examples, the person, the place, and the thing that happened in the scripture. Many examples. So when we talk about contextual inconsistencies, we're talking about things that the preacher says are simply bits and pieces put together to make a sermon. Jesus said a wise man built his house upon the rock. A foolish man built his house upon the sand. What is sand? Sand is simply little rocks that are not in unity. That they're... That they don't, they, don't, they don't say the same thing. But a rock is solid. A rock is unified. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, the Apostle Paul said, I beseech you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing, that you be perfectly bound together with the same mind, that there be no division. When you have division, you have confusion. When you have confusion... You have the Word of God being altered. When you mess with the message, you change its results. I know of people that go to church every time the church has a revival. They go there, they last for a few days, and then they're gone because they never got what they needed at that church to support their desire to live for God. They went back to smoking. They went back to drinking. It takes the power of God. The power of God is the inner strength to say no to temptation, to say no to your flesh, to bring your flesh under control and in harmony with the will of God for your life. Contextual inconsistencies are being taught everywhere today. We're looking for contextual consistency, and that only happens after you look at all of the scriptures that speak about a particular subject or topic. We're going to be talking some more about contextual inconsistencies in the next few lessons. There are many of them. Open your Bible. Follow through with it. Read it for yourself. The scriptures that we show on the screen. That's the Word of God. That's alive. That is spiritual life that is speaking to you. It's out of the book we call the Bible. Any input, any questions, please email us at the New Covenant Apostolic Church at gmail.com. I've been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified.